All right. We are ready to go ahead and get started. Thanks everyone for joining us in person and virtually. This is our virtual attendant right here. There's about 15, I think, people online right now. Um, so um, this is our October CEU for Casa Lexington. And um, it is Understanding and Working with LGBTQ Youth. And it's being presented by Carmen Walbert Collins. Uh, just a couple of quick notes. There's bathrooms at either end of the building. Uh, you walk right through here. There's two right here. There's two on the other end in the same way. Um, there's water over there if anyone wants some water. And there are some snacks over here. And um, we will go ahead and get started. Well, um, as Ben said, I'm Carmen Walker Collins, and I am the um, executive director for the Lexington Pride Center, which is it's the oldest um, LGBTQ organization in Kentucky. We've been around in some form or another since the late 70s, so we've been doing this for a long, long time, educating and working with the public and um, that sort of thing. So I'm really happy that y'all asked me out. I've been reading up a little on what you do, and I think y'all could have a really important role to play in young people's lives and LGBTQ young people's lives. Um, so I'm really happy to be here. And um, yeah, with that, let's get started. So I just wanted to first, um, we always set kind of ground rules for what we expect that it will make people feel like sharing and feel safe. Um, and if anybody has anything they want to add to this, you can certainly do that. Be smarter than your phone, so we just ask you to turn down or turn off your phone. If you have to take a call or a text, if you step out of the room to do that, that would be great. Um, this is the place for questions. If there's anything you've ever wanted to know, this is the time to ask it. You know, instead of asking your LGBTQ friends or feeling like you don't know enough to be comfortable, you know, this is what we do. We get paid for it. No questions are too stupid. You know, we've heard everything <laughs> doing this, so... The Vegas rule, and that means anything that's shared here stays here. Anything you learn can leave here, um, but you know you don't want to expose identities and people and that kind of thing. This is Burley Thomas. He's our office manager joining us now. He has some handouts and things. He's going to get ready. That's part of our team. We have to take a Yeah, <laughs> that's for you. Um, so LOL, which just means we can be light with this. There can be jokes. We can have a lot. It doesn't have to be a serious thing. It's a lot of fun. Um, and share the air. So, you know, if you find yourself talking a whole lot, maybe think about stepping back to let other people share. Um, or if you haven't said anything, you know, just consider being brave enough to step into this space. And that's part of what we hope to do is create braver spaces. And just reserve the right to change your mind. Like we all have different lenses on the world and we all have different backgrounds and experiences walking into this room. So I would just encourage you to let, you know, weigh what you learned today um, and feel free to change your mind. You might learn something new. Try to stay open-minded. So I would like to get started before we go into this. If we, we don't have a, a huge amount of people here, if we could go around the room, if people could just share their name and pronouns and just... If there's something really what you want to get out of this experience today and you can have people write in online if you all want to share in comments yeah anyone online um why don't we go around the room and then okay. anyone online can unmute okay. and do that okay. too awesome thanks for here sure my name is melissa morton do you use she her he him they them pronouns yeah like all of those yeah <laughs> okay <laughs> cool and uh is there anything you particularly want to learn today um, I kind of want to learn that exactly all the pronouns we will uh because I work with a lot of that, yeah, and that totally confuses me. Yeah, it does for a lot of people. We will have we will do a lot of that, so yeah. My name is Alex Alouche, uh, she, her, and um, I just really want to learn more about the Pride Center and just like what it could offer our LGBT awesome. youth that we work okay. with. Great, yeah. I'm Terry Huffman, uh, I'm a he. And I want to know the best way to handle an LBG, LGBTQ youth. Okay. Because, you know, they're a certain age that they don't know what they are. Yeah. So, we, can, we can definitely talk about this. A lot of this, will, there is some specifically stuff about youth, but a lot of these things will apply to people of all ages, and we can talk more and answer your questions specifically about youth. Because we, we do a lot of that. Mm -hmm. Sorry, next. Oh. 
And I'm great at bowling, and I'm like her. I want to learn more about the program. Oh, yeah. I, I'm the older generation, sure. so uh, this is something totally new as far as labeling goes. Yeah. Yep. But I just want to know the best approach, uh, any tools that we can use from okay. this high on up, yes. you know, yes. just to get them comfortable mm-hmm. enough and to be able to have a listening ear sure. versus what we think, yep. you know, so. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm Keely Griffin, she, her, um, and I just want to learn more about the resources that we can be learning and how we can best act. Awesome. I'm Mary Dyer, and I just just want to know more about him. Okay, awesome. Uh, Elise Melrude, I'm uh, gay, and she, her, okay. and uh, <laughs> I remember going to a, a program early on when my friends was doing what you're doing, and somebody asked, is it in the jeans? And uh, so she was wearing jeans, and you know. She said no. Depends on what jeans you're wearing. Well, is there any particular? No, I just uh, I just want to hear what you have to say. And uh, I'm Ann Flynn, and I'm she, her, and I'm gay, and I. Only have four point five hours. <laughs> so <laughs> well, it's gonna be honest. That's all right. We're happy to do a little bit of for you. <laughs> I'm Ava Crow, she her. I'm not as funny as she is. Um, I'm also gay yes, okay. and um, just here to kind of learn what I need to know that I don't awesome. know. Awesome. Okay, that sounds that sounds great. And we have anything online? Anyone online? Hi, I'm Terry Potter, and um, I just want to be compassionate and helpful to everyone in this community and not offend or insult anyone because of my ignorance. So I'm hoping to learn a whole lot tonight. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Kirsten Adkins. She, her, and I'm just here to um, learn all kinds of new things um, to support advocates um, who have questions and um, help them through this process. Hi, I'm Jennifer Barr. Um, She, her, and I am also here to learn more uh, and I'm excited to hear all about it. I am Nancy Tucker, and I'm here to learn to make sure that I'm respectful with people. This is Beth Monarch, and I have the same comments as everyone else in terms of why I'm here. Appreciate the presentation. I'm Carol Polly, she, her, and also interested in learning what kind of resources we can get uh, from the Pride Center. Awesome. Does anybody have anything different than what has already been said? Anything nobody has listed so far about what you want to learn? I think we're going to do move on. Awesome. So also, I will say I am a lesbian as well, and Burley is gay. So if anybody wants to jump in, you know, one of the things in this training is um, language changes a lot and people have different preferences or lots of different identities. So there is no 100% right way. And the big rule of thumb, if you take nothing else away today, is to listen and respect what people ask of you. People may identify in different ways and want different language to use. It's not going to be 100% across the board. So we'll start there. Go ahead and bring this on. So here's kind of the agenda. We're going to first go over what is LGBTQ plus anyway? What do all those letters mean? What's the difference in gender and sexuality? Um, Then we'll talk about why you should even care. Like, why does it matter that you guys volunteering and doing what you're doing? that you've learned this stuff. 
Um, and then we'll go over a little more in-depth terminology, talking about different terms, preferred terms and language, and the all-important pronouns. <laughs> we'll go over that in depth. Um, and then number four, we'll talk about um, what a friend of mine who runs Open Doors Counseling calls confidently affirming care or services. Um, and that's really how to support um, your kids, your clients that are LGBTQIA and some tips for how to do that. And then we'll have time, hopefully, for just questions and answers. So anything we didn't cover, feel free to write it down and we'll come back to it then. All right. So as I said, language changes. So right now, the um, acronym that we use varies a little, but it's something like LGBTQ plus or LGBTQIA. But back in the 1940s and 50s, the word they used for the not straight people was homophiles. If the the 60s and 70s, it was homosexual or gay. In the 70s and 80s, it was gay and lesbian. In the 80s and 90s, it became lesbian, gay, and bisexual with transgender in parentheses. And then the 90s to 2000s was LGBTQ or, or LGBT or queer. And now we use LGBTQ plus, or there's this big long acronym that will go over LGBTQIA 2P or queer. So, <laughs> there is no perfect solution to this. <laughs> I will tell you that. But that's just so you know the different terms that are, that have been used and how it can change, and it's still changing. So if you want to go ahead. So LGBTQIA+, it is an acronym, and it really tries to encompass a whole bunch of diverse sexualities and genders. Um, folks often refer to the Q, standing for queer, as an umbrella term. And so that can also, sometimes people just use the term queer. Other people don't like that, and you never want to be called queer. So like I said, there is no one right way. You just kind of have to listen to the feedback people give you. It is helpful to have terms because we're all different with this is, and this umbrella, umbrella. And what we're really trying to say is like people who aren't straight, right? Or, or people who are gender diverse. Um, so the umbrella contains both sexualities, which are on this side, lesbian, gay, bisexual, pansexual, and asexual, and genders, which is transgender, non-binary, genderqueer, agender, and gender fluid. So it gets a lot more confusing when you start looking at gender and sexuality together. The next one. So the, the, the categories that are gender, one, I don't know if you've heard of intersex, that's the I in the big long equation, is a person with varying gender characteristics. And this is fairly common, about 1.7% of the population. And um, it's not more common today, I don't think, but people just didn't used to be aware of it. And so that would be like a baby that's born with either mixed uh, physical gender characteristics or they're finding out now that they can also have mixed chromosomes. And you may never know that. People may be intersex and walking around and never know and wouldn't know unless you got your chromosomes tested. Um, and then it's fairly frequent. Um, but these days we're trying to, and people are as, uh, becoming aware, stopping doing Typically, they do gender assignment surgeries on young infants and just assign a gender whether or not that was their true gender without letting them grow into it. And so there is a push to get folks away from that and to wait until kids kind of identify <laughs> what gender they are. And so transgender is a person can be any sexuality. Intersex or transgender people can be any of those sexualities. But transgender is a person who is assigned a certain gender at birth but then does not identify with that gender as they grow older. So they express their gender in non-traditional ways. So lesbian, the L stands for woman, a woman and woman in a relationship. Gay stands for man and man, although there's a large use of the term gay also to mean the whole community or, or gay women as well. B is for bisexual, which just means I am a certain gender identity and I feel attraction to other gender identity. Doesn't just necessarily mean one, it mean more than one. Um, queer is whatever, basically just not straight, <laughs> is what that means. And asexual is a person who has little or no sexual attraction to others. So that's the short list. This goes over transgender people. Um, and you always want to say transgender as a descriptive, a transgender person as an adjective. It's not transgendered or a transgender, which is a really easy mistake that a lot of people make. Um, and that's someone who does not physically, emotionally, or spiritually align with their gender assigned at birth. They might have gender dysphoria. They might want to medically transition with hormones and surgeries. 
Um, they might want to socially trans just transition without any medical um, interference. Um, it's different for every person. So a transgender person can look and be and exist in a lot of different ways. So it's an important thing to know. So this is going to break down the whole thing. <laughs> all of the letters. These are all of the ones I know currently. The L is for lesbian. The G is for gay. The B is for bisexual. P e is for transgender. Q is for queer and questioning. I is for intersex. A is for asexual or agender. Sometimes also allies will claim a space there, though that's very controversial among different people in the community. He is for pansexual, which means someone who is attracted to multiple genders, not just one other than their own, but any gender or multiple genders. And then two-spirit is um, a term that's commonly used by Native Indigenous communities um, for folks who are either trans or in some way queer, and that was terminology that was originally used in their cultures to express that identity, and a lot of them are reclaiming that, so especially where there are a lot of um, indigenous folks, you will see that in the, in the acronym. That, those are currently today all of the letters that I know, and people put those together in different ways. <laughs> oh, these are the different ways they LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus, LGBTQ star. Those are just some of the different different categories of different way of things you can see, and it basically all means the umbrella <laughs> of people who are queer, not straight. All right, so moving on to why should we care? So we're just gonna go over a little bit some of the um, discrimination and statistics related to LGBTQ folks. Um, rejection is definitely a part of most, most people who have had to come out have, even if they've been accepted, have had to face that fear before they come out to um, their loved ones, their job, their school. And it, it can be tough, it can be traumatic, depending on what the people around you's responses are. And, um, you know, even if it goes well, that experience can be traumatic. So 40% of LGBTQ adults have experienced rejection from family or close friends. And a lot of times that happens when they're kids, when they're youth. That 2019 school time survey showed that 86% of LGBTQ youth reported being harassed or assaulted at school. And I think that's a significant impact on mental health than any LGBTQ kids who are, unless they go to a very, very um, progressive school, are probably going to experience this like across the board. Um, more than half of LGBTQ Americans hit a personal relationship to avoid discrimination. And this chart kind of goes over all the different places. The highest rate is um, they hit they hit a personal relationship. Um, you know, it also affects our decisions about where to work. Um, it can also change the way we act, or you know, we may not be ourselves in our clothing or our dress or the way we express ourselves. So it really affects. If someone's LGBTQ, it affects the entire um, sort of ask all the aspects of our lives. Um, this was a study showing that LGBTQ Americans experience high levels of discrimination in public spaces, at school, and in the workplace. So over 50% of everybody of transgender people and of people of color face discrimination in public spaces. Um, it's a little less than that for workplaces and for school. And this kind of goes on down for your rental, where you live, interacting with law enforcement and somewhere else. There are all kinds of different forms of discrimination. It doesn't look like just one thing. Um, labeling, stereotyping, denial of opportunities or access, and verbal, mental, or physical abuse. Heightened risk for PTSD. Um, religion can be a big one for people. We actually get, uh, a lot of time we get approached by people who are very religious and who have, it's been very common lately, a real struggle with accepting their own identity and being who they are and still believing in the religion they believe in and finding resources for those folks who still are people of faith but want to live an outlay. And it's really damaging to folks to be, you know, they've grown up in a community in a church 
And then when they try to express their who they truly are, they are kicked out of that community. Um, don't ask, don't tell. A lot of times people will say, I mean, there are policies we've all heard in, of the military probably is the biggest one that, you know, we just don't talk about it. And that's the, you know, we hear a lot, why, why do we have to talk about it? But for people who are LGBTQ, their lives no different than anybody else. Like we wanna be able to talk about our lives with our friends, with our colleagues, you know, with people in our lives. And it forces people having that kind of attitude, forces people to hide who they are, basically. Um, conversion therapy is another huge form. It has been completely discredited. There is no evidence of any kind that conversion therapy works. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, research that shows that it doesn't work at all, um, it is damaging. Go ahead and click the next. Um, there's no scientific ev evidence. Um, and it can cause you know, long lasting mental health issues. The percentage of kids who are exposed to conversion therapy who have suicide attempts rises dramatically when they go through conversion therapy. And this kind of shows that out for no conversion therapy, there's 17% of youth attempted suicide and of LGBTQ youth and 42% um, attempt suicide who have had conversion therapy. So substance use, LGBT, LGB are twice as likely than hetero adults to experience substance use and trans adults are four times as likely than cisgender individuals. 100, we have a 120% higher risk of experiencing homelessness. Sometimes that's because of family rejection. You know, kids are thrown out, you know, are not accepted and don't have another place to go. Um, that's especially true among Black LGBTQI youth. Um, and, and we see this a lot at the center, a lot, a lot, the rising rates of folks who come in who are homeless um, and there are not good resources because homeless shelters, especially for trans people, typically divide folks among gender lines and there just aren't a lot of safe spaces. And a lot of our folks would rather stay on the streets than go to a place where they can't be out. Um, so these are just some more statistics. We can go through this pretty quick. Um, LGBTQ adults are more than twice as likely to experience a mental health condition. Transgender people nearly four times as likely. LGBT youth are more than twice as likely to have persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness. Transgender youth are two times as likely to experience depressive symptoms, seriously consider suicide and attempt suicide compared to cis LGBT youth. Um, as a whole, we are at higher risk than heterosexual cisgender population for suicidal thoughts and suicide attempts. High school students are more than four times as likely to have attempted suicide than their heterosexual peers. And 40% of transgender adults have attempted suicide in their lifetime compared to less than 5% for the general population. And that shows the big, the big barrier, the big difference. So it is important to note though, I mean, those uh, statistics are pretty harsh, but it does not mean that LGBTQI people are somehow damaged or at greater risk um, genetically for higher rates of mental illness or all of these other things, but rather because of our identities and the discrimination and the rejection and isolation we may face, we're set, set up for that. And we do live joyful, full, and complete lives. And we have many strengths because of our identities. And you know, the good news is um, what you all do and what we do in the community can really make a difference around that. Um, I think there's a statistic in here somewhere that says, you know, one caring adult in a child's life who accepts them can um, decrease the risk of a suicide attempt by 40%. You know, and you, you can be that adult, <laughs> you know, it's really easy by doing a few things. Um, LGBTQIA people cannot separate our gender and sexual identities from the rest of who we are. And I think that's really important to understand. Like we are many faceted people, all of us, none of us are just one thing. Um, so you can't cut off the identity from the person. And that is not the only thing that affects our experience as well. Um, so again, just one accepting adult can reduce the risk of suicide by 40%. And that's why the care you give and affirming care, giving affirming care and services is so important because it really can change lives. So we're going to dig into the terminology a little bit more. 
All right, you can go ahead and just click all of these up if you don't mind. But I won't talk about each one of them, but um, I just want y'all to take a few minutes. These are some core terms within the community and within used within the LGBTQ community. Are there any of these that anybody doesn't know what they mean, or you may think you know but are not sure? Maybe just a couple of minutes to look at that, and then and then we can talk about it. Any... Anybody see any of they or biphobia? Biphobia? Yeah, that, so that's um, a term used to describe um, bisexual people may be discriminated against both in the heterosexual and the queer communities. Um, the people who don't understand or are afraid of or discriminate against people who are bisexual, and it may be, you know, saying things like, that's just a phase you're going through, or you have to pick a side, you know, or just delegitimizing folks who whose actual experience is having attraction to more than one gender of person. Is, question? Yeah. Okay. Question. Yeah. You have a Questioning. Question? Oh, questioning. <laughs> oh, I love that. You said it. Yeah. Question. <laughs> Questioning is for, <laughs> is, is for folks who just don't know. They don't know. They don't feel comfortable with the label. They may not feel straight. They're not sure. A lot of times we use it in our labels, especially for you, because they may not be comfortable coming to a group where there isn't some, you know, like a question involved. They may not want to claim a label that may keep them from coming to groups that could support them. And we try to support people, kids, everybody, like where they are. Like you don't have to know 100% when you walk in your door that you're gay or that you're bi. Um, so we that's why that's included. Sometimes folks just don't know. Someone online said passing. Passing? So passing is a term that's used for a lot of marginalized identities. And it means trying not to be seen as that marginalized identity. Um, a lot of folks who are trans will the trans community, that word is used a lot. Um, some trans folks do, they don't want it to be known that they're trans. So they want to appear as a cis person. They don't want to talk about being trans. They don't want people to, they say, clock them, you know, to, to catch them as being trans. But it's also a word, I mean, it could be for, for gay people, for lesbians, anybody who's trying to fit into the norm, <laughs> so to speak, and not be a part of the the, their, the community, uh, the minority community of which they are a part. Uh, um, is cisgender the same as heterosexual? It's a little bit different, but yeah, it's the same principle. So instead of using words like normal gender or norm, it's um, if you're not trans, you're cisgender. So instead of calling one normal and one trans or one normal and one gay, it's heterosexual and cisgender. Yeah. Others? Any other questions about these terms or any other terms or words? What about heteronormativity? Yeah. So heteronormativity is kind of in life, in our society, most things tend toward being heteronormative. The assumption is made on TV and movies, in most places who don't have a lot of education. Like there, I show up and I'm asked if I am married and how my husband is, right? Like it's an assumption. It's that assumption that everybody is straight and or cisgender and that we confirm to the norms that have been laid out for us. <laughs> yeah. Anything else on this? And there are lots of resources you can go and uh, look at core terms online. Burley may have brought handouts. I'm not sure with with language on them, but they are out there, um, and you can get more information about all of this. But I don't want to spend the whole time going. If people kind of know what words mean, um, and don't have questions about them, we can move on to the next thing. Can I add something? Yeah, absolutely. So you brought up questioning earlier, and we said gay earlier was the identifier for men who are with men. But in some identities where they don't yet identify as queer, gay, whatever, the we'll use the an acronym MSM, like men who have sex with men. 
Uh, yeah. Like in that way, we don't identify somebody's sexuality yeah. by a certain behavior. Yeah. And, and that's really important. Thanks for bringing that up. And if anybody else has stuff they want to throw in to you, feel free. Um, we try to, especially like for health, you know, we, we've done these talks with folks um, who do HIV and AIDS prevention, and it's really critical that you're talking about behavior and not identity because everybody who may engage in the same behavior may not identify in the same way. And that's different among cultures, among individuals, you know, someone's label may not indicate like who they have sex with necessarily. <laughs> like that's different for everybody. And so, you know, especially for healthcare folks, it's really important to understand and not, not make the assumption that, you know, if I'm a lesbian, then I never ever have sex with men, for example. Like you can't, you know, or uh, to folks may say I'm not gay, a man may say I'm not gay, but that doesn't mean he's not having sex with men. It just means he doesn't identify as gay. So. Do you have the uh, handout, the uh, language handout? Did you already get yeah, it? I have. Is this one you're talking about? Yeah, I don't know. Did I get it? I know several language ones, I guess. Mm -hmm. I got the terms to be avoided. Yes. I got language matters, the gingerbread person. I will use this one. This is not the one I usually use, but it'll work. Okay. 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 So here you can cool. Thank you. Um so there are some just, I know people worry about making mistakes. And so the first thing I'll say is we're all going to make them, <laughs> you know, and that's okay. And so what's important is to like, listen to your kids, listen to your youth. And um, if you make a mistake or they correct you, don't make it a big deal. Just apologize and try to do better and go, go on. It's going to happen. And you shouldn't like, you shouldn't let it stop you from engaging with people. Like it's just part of the process. Um, but you know, one of one of the um, the the big around transgender folks, it, it is using transgender as an adjective. You know, a transgender or transgendered is not; it's considered offensive. Um, but we have even transgender folks do it. So that is, you know, we've had to. Someone brought us flyers into the into the center to put out, and we're like, um, "You're going to have to correct." That was a transgender business, but. We had to ask them to correct it <laughs> because it wasn't using, you know, commonly what's considered great language. Um, so the, one of the other things about the, the correct terminology for trans folks right now is you'll hear these um, acronyms AFAB and AMAB, and that stands for assigned female at birth and assigned male at birth, rather than um, born a girl or boy, born a boy, because the theory is folks weren't born that they were just told what they were. <laughs> it wasn't that, you know, they may have always been the gender they were, it just wasn't recognized or accepted. So, um, so AFAB and AMAB are the preferred, um, you know, assigned female at birth, assigned male at birth. Um, then hopefully I'll know not to use most of the really derogatory fag, faggot, dyke, homo, fairy, les, puff, those kinds of words, and, you know, unless you are a member of the community and are referring to yourself. And some people have reclaimed some of those words and you will see them. And I would argue even that queer, if you're not a member of the community, probably shouldn't use it um, because those are all words that were used to discriminate and belittle people. Um, and then a lot of them have been reclaimed, but there's still a lot of controversy within the community. Do you have words to say about that, sir? No? Um, Homosexual is one that typically we don't use it anymore. Um, it's more medical, it's more clinical. So most folks will just say I'm gay or, um, you know, homosexual usually um, demonstrates like a reserve or a disconnection <laughs> from the person. So um, it was a diagnosis. It was, it was a diagnosis. Right? Yeah. So that's it was. Yeah. It was only that label was used to diagnose you with something that was wrong with you. Um, lifestyle, which was you know, common for a while, like there is no one single lifestyle that all of us follow. You know, there's not a rule book, but you don't have to like live this way to be this gay. So that's kind of fallen out of favor. Um, Can so, I just say something about yeah, that? Absolutely. As far as lifestyle goes, um, uh, 
people who are don't know much about the queer community, they say uh, it's a choice. Yes. It misses your lifestyle, but yeah. it isn't a choice. It isn't a choice. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You're yeah. right. And that's you why change, you can change your lifestyle if you wanted to. Yes. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. I do have a question about that. So, okay, I work the medical field and I had a couple um, a couple weeks ago, for instance, okay? And I had one of my coworkers that did not take the information right on the patient. So I got asked to go back in there and make sure that the patient information was correct. Yep. Okay. So I walk into the room. I can definitely tell that the patient laying in that bed was a female. On the paperwork, it said it was a male. So I looked at the person sitting next to the bed, and I could also tell it was another female, but it said spouse, which at that point, I'm looking at both females, and in my head, it clicked. That's probably her wife. Mm -hmm. Which I'm like, okay, you know, it, it is her spouse. Mm -hmm. No big deal. So in my head, I'm like, how am I going to ask her, hey, you know, are you her spouse? But I have to do it gently because either A, they're going to get really PO'd, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, because somebody already came in and did this. Or it's going to go real bad. You know, like, or she's going to be real cool about it. Yeah. So I asked, you know, ma'am, you know, I'm going to ask. I said, is this your uh, spouse? And she looked at me and she's like, yes. And I was like, okay. And her wife stared at me for a second. And she's like, do we have a problem? And I said, no, ma'am. I said, I just wanted to make sure, you know, that we got the information correct. And I said, I have to ask one more question. I said, were you born? I said, a male or a female? And she's like, I was born a female. And I said, okay. I said, thank you. I said, I do have to change that in your medical records. And she's like, I thought so. She's like, but they never asked. And I said, I said, okay. I said, I'm very sorry about that. Yeah. They have three who was most uncomfortable in that situation. Yeah. Well, <laughs> my coworker gets very uncomfortable. Yeah. And that's normally where they send me in. Yeah. But that's why we need to have these kind of trainings and also to accept being uncomfortable. Like we um, sort of promote asking, but making that normal. So that, like you, you may have thought you could tell by looking, but you can't always tell someone's gender by looking. So really, if we start to normalize asking everyone, that's the best way to go. And I think in our discussions and y'all and everybody can jump in, I would rather be asked then assume that I'm straight, which happens so many times in a doctor's office <laughs> for me. Like, I would just rather have that as part of the intake. You know, are you married? Is your spouse male or female? Like, because that's not offensive. That's just you're trying to get information. And there are times when for trans people, you may need to know whether they were assigned female at birth or assigned male at birth for medical reasons and, and a place and a time to ask that. But you shouldn't assume that by looking and it should only be related to what you need to know, right? I mean, I know there are some programs, and I, I don't know how PASA works, where there's a legal you know, reason that you have to identify. But if you don't have to, like, just letting them determine it is the best way. Yeah. But nine times out of ten, when you go into a hospital or a doctor's office, you're filling out your own paperwork anyway. Yeah. So that question to me is <clears throat> whether you straight, gay, whatever, mm -hmm. I just don't feel like unless it's a procedure or something that needs to be taken care of at that point in time yeah. or a medical emergency. Yeah. I don't feel like they really have to know the gist of that because you putting your social down, you putting male, female, are you married? Are you not? You divorced? I mean, 
So, so the reason is just like you're <clears throat> saying, like the assumption of sp- like someone thinks your spouse is not your spouse because you're a same sex couple. And like a lot of the time, those questions aren't even in on intake form. Right. So if you were allowed to self determine that when you go in or to not put the information on, right. or if you don't need the information, leave all of those questions off and just ask people when you see them. Yeah, because but I think need- that's the same as when they're asking, are you Hispanic? Are you mixed? Yeah. Are you black? Are you yeah. African American? Are you just don't want to answer? Yeah. And so, I- Exactly. As that long as it's not yeah. like I said, a medical emergency yeah. and that particular thing. I agree. I, mean, I don't think that's really any concern. Just you should have the option to read it, not you know? to answer for sure. Right. But you should also be able to express who you are without right. being afraid of being rejected. Right. So I would rather someone ask me, you know, if if my spouse was female rather than being assumed that I was right. a man, right? So I would rather have that question and have someone follow up and be sure. Um, but it's, like I said, it's different for everybody. But I think the best practice is to have intake that makes that all consistent. Right. So, so I'm at work, I always say, do you have a significant other? Yeah. Yes. That's, what, that's the term I use because we have like... Uh, credits that you can use if you punch in and they'll be like, no, I don't want to put my number in. I'll say, okay, there's your significant yeah. number. Other yeah. have it because yeah. they want your point. Yeah. So go ahead yeah. and put it in. Yeah. I, that way you're not a significant point. other spat. The less you can assume, the better. Right. As long as you're affirming of whatever exactly. they no choose to reveal. No. You're not making an assumption that that's significant no. of, of one gender. Or right. That's, that's fine. But I do think it's also okay to ask. I don't know how other people feel if you all have anybody else who's LGBTQ in the room has feelings about how right. that uh, I try to sorry. normally I try to always make jokes so normally mine is is this your honey yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> say you know is this your husband is this your wife right. and I try to always be like right. hey is this your other half or is this your honey right. you know yeah you know like but that this wasn't mine in the first place <laughs> so when I walked into the room like they were both just their eyes were beaming at me. So I was like, ooh, well, what did I just walk into? <laughs> you, know, like, ooh. you know, either this is going to go real bad or real good, you know. I, I couldn't read that room. So I was like, ooh. But, um, so another thing just related to trans folks is not assuming that someone has had surgery or is preoperative or post, but there are lots of trans folks who never will have surgery or don't want surgery or, you know, not making assumptions about what's in someone's pants, period, is probably regardless of gender or sexuality is, is a good thing. Um, not asking those kinds of personal questions that you wouldn't ask from anybody else, like if you don't have a reason, a medical reason to know, um, is a good rule of thumb. Um, Phrases like that's so gay or really popular. That's not really cool because you're talking about seeing being something weird or bad or or awful. Um, we talked about these. Um, some really offensive words are tranny, she male, he she, um, and normally it to describe a trans or non-binary person, though a lot of people are reclaiming that pronoun it, but you would only ever use it if folks ask you to. So some people that's their preferred pronoun. Um Are there other questions about like terms to use, practices to use, what to avoid? I I was at feedback real quick. You you talked about you couldn't read the room and you went in and before you asked the question, they were if they were beaming at you or whatever. Like I personally get real like apprehensive and defensive when I'm in medical space because of past experiences where some of you would assume, or I'll even self-disclose and I'll get met with something like, well, when did you choose to be gay? You know, or something when they're doing my records. And I'm like, yeah. well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I have I have kids and, um, you know, we get the, who's the real mom question a lot, which is, you know, in this day and age, I'm like, and I, you know, I always speak back to the provider and I'm like, we both are. Well, do you know what I meant? I'm like, I know what you meant, but say what you meant. Like what you meant is he was the biological parent. And if you need to know that for records, but we're both his real mom, <laughs> you know, like those kind of things that and you do. Like, I, I know I get tense before I go to a new provider trying to figure out what I'm going to have to explain. And so the more that you can meet that 
at the front door with acceptance. Like I saw your all this like flag sticker on the front door that always makes me feel a lot better if I heard you see people putting it out there that they're affirming and you know having some level of knowledge around around LGBTQ issues. Other questions? Any other questions about like what not language to use or not to use? Or we'll talk more about pronouns and those kinds of things. I'm point out that tranny also is now an inclusive term of not even five years ago or so it was like maybe 10 years ago. It was totally the norm. It was like a normal term that we all yeah. used and then just one day trans community was like, you can stop that now. Yeah. So we did, we do. So to talk a little bit, someone asked a question about, you know, sexual orientation is not the same as gender identity and having both of those types of identity makes things way more interesting and complicated. <laughs> so sex, generally when people are talking about sex, they mean the sex assigned at birth. And so that's a very medical term and they're talking about physical secondary sex uh, characteristics or hormones or gonads or chromosomes, those medical scientific things that say whether you're male or female or somewhere in between. Um, gender is usually um, how a person perceives themselves. So that's how you understand what you understand your gender to be for yourself. Um, gender expression is how you how a person dresses and move it, moves and express themselves in the world. Um, so that's a whole other thing. And then sexual orientation is who you are romantically, emotionally, or sexually attracted to. So all of these are actually different things. And the way that um, they show up in every individual person is different. And so we try to, and labels are great to help you find your people and connect with people and for a lot of different reasons, as long as you are giving them to yourself. But it can also be complicated. And one of the reasons we have new terminology and new words to categorize people, and you know, we, we run a GSA group every week, and you know, we are learning all of the time about new labels, new omnisexual, and I don't you know some of the newer burly. <laughs> I, I work with our teen group, and yeah. seventh graders tell me new words like all the time. <laughs> yeah, uh, omnisexual, polysexual, which are both branches of pansexual, which fall under the bisexual yeah. umbrella. Yeah. Um, and what I really like for me, I don't know, I'm like a, a word nerd, I guess I'm a reader. Um, when you have permission to discuss your identity, so you have bisexual. Well, what about the gender spectrum? Okay, well, we have pansexual. It's bisexual, we're just including the spectrum. But then you get inside pansexual and people start discussing, what is my pansexual identity? And maybe you're an androphile, which means I'm attracted to masculinity. So you like cisgendered males or transgendered males, but not transgender females, cisgender females, and non-binary. That's polysexual. <laughs> so it's just like ever more definition yeah. in identity. And it's become you know? more to talk about it for yeah. the first time. Yeah. The more you talk about it, the more discrepancy you discover. It's kind of like the paint wall at Lowe's. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It's like it's green. green. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, it's, yeah. So, you know, once you kind of, when gender, when you start to open up and think about gender as non binary, there are folks who can identify somewhere in between or off the gender spectrum or not necessarily male or female, then it makes sexual orientation that much more complicated. Because if you're not identifying as a gender, how do you take a sexual orientation? <laughs> right. So it just it just broadens that whole kaleidoscope. Neptosexual people that are only attracted to non-binary people. <laughs> <laughs> That that age kid is who we work with. Oh, we our our kids are seventh graders, or yeah. you know, and they would tell you this stuff. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like, I learn everything from kids now. If they, yeah, if if you get them, if they start talking, they'll tell you all kinds of stuff. And, yeah, and just. Be ready. So that's and that's another thing someone talked about, like younger kids and how soon they know. And so what we're finding is earlier and earlier and earlier. And part of that is the change in parents being accepting because and we literally had someone whose five-year-old came out to her as a lesbian you know and insisted on it 
consistent. And, you know, 20, 30 years ago, no parents would have listened to that, right? But if you have parents who are listening to their kids, all of a sudden they're taken seriously. And they do know, they do generally know. I mean, sometimes kids will switch or they'll question, but um, I always say, like, it doesn't hurt anything. Like, listening to kids who kids think they are, you know, they may change their mind later, but it doesn't hurt anything to, <laughs> to be accepting of who they think they are in the present moment. And, and gender it is fluid and changes. Your gender identity, your sexual identity can change. You know, what you, you may think you're straight for many years and then suddenly realize maybe not, you know? So it changes for everyone. So I don't know if you all have seen this uh, gender uniform. You all should have one of those. But this is um, a tool that was developed by a trans student organization to kind of explain the differences in um, gender and sexuality across the spectrum. And I love it because it's really, really, um, it covers every one of the you know, gender identity, gender expression, sex assigned at birth your physical attraction and your emotional attraction. So everybody, regardless of who you are, what you are, identifies somewhere on the spectrum of each one of those things. And so I like to think of it as imagining, like if you move your levers on each of these things, and I wish we had an app that did this, you would have a completely unique, you know, unicorn that just applied to you <laughs> once you land. Um, you know, and again, gender identity, a lot of, an old way that people talk about it is gender, gender identity is in your head, your sex is between your legs, and your gender expression is what you wear and how you present yourself to the world. And then the types of attraction, and there are many more than this, but, you know, who you're physically attracted to and who you're emotionally attracted to. And all of those things can be different. You know, you may have um, been assigned a male at birth, um, and you may have a feminine gender expression, but think of yourself as non-binary. So it really doesn't, it doesn't correlate and you can be attracted to girls and boys or both or none or, um, so it's just one model to show like how that's fluid and different for everybody. So personal pronouns, we all know what personal pronouns are. They're the words we use to refer to people that replace their names. So, um, we are used to, most of us grew up with personal pronouns indicating gender, so he, she, but they don't have to. So, go ahead. so the common ones are she, her, hers, he, him, his. A really popular one now is they, them, there. There are lots of folks who use that pronoun, uh, young people. It is, has kind of been reclaimed as, and it's being used by younger people. You know, one of our coworkers prefers it as their pronoun. Um, and then they call these other kinds of pronouns, these are theirs, these um, zes, neo pronouns, but they have really been around since like the 60s or 70s. <laughs> you know, when people were using them in literature and writing. You know. um, so the big thing is, again, just not to make assumptions. Um, I think <clears throat> some of the best ways to do that is, you know, I think someone else speaking to said, y'all put your pronouns on your on your badges, is that true? And so that's a good tool to say, you know, like I understand pronouns and why they're important. And then what we do is often introduce ourselves and share our pronouns and then ask someone else to share theirs. Um, Cause I know it can feel weird asking um, and it can be, it's strangely, it may be not the right choice for someone who isn't out. You know, they may not want to identify their pronoun or may feel put off because you've asked them their pronoun. Um, but there are ways to indicate that you're comfortable with that and to give people the space to let you know, like to let you know. So here's some of those, yeah, give your pronouns when you introduce yourself. Don't ever make assumptions based on appearance. One of the things Burley does is defaults to they, them until, until he knows what someone's preference is. Um, if you don't know what pronouns to use, you can default to they, just use their name and avoid pronouns. You can ask, but be careful around that. Just make sure you're not outing them or asking them in a place that's not comfortable and giving them space not to tell you if they don't want. When someone shares their pronouns, respect them and use them. So that's the biggest deal. And I know a lot of people think that's fake or not important, but it really is. And it doesn't, like, we're not saying you have to change your belief and that you have to love pronouns, but it's so, so important that when someone shares with you how they want to be identified, 
And it's a really core part of your identity. If you think about your gender and the pronouns you use, if someone called you by a pronoun that you didn't use, it's really, it's not good. <laughs> you know, it's really, really hurtful. So if you do mess up, and we will, and I mean, I know I have a nephew that, you know, I knew for over 20 years as she, and it was now he. And do I screw it up sometimes? I sure do, <laughs> you know, because part of it is habit. But it's just important to, if you mess up, apologize, correct yourself, and just move on. Don't make it a big deal for them to make you feel better, you know, but just do your own research and let them know that you can handle it and you support them, you know, move on. And practice. So one of our other rules of thumb is when I mess up, and we have this a lot at the center because we have people who, you know, switch genders or switch names and switch pronouns. And um, one rule of thumb is if you say out loud, you know, their wrong name or pronoun, they, then you try to, as soon as you can, use their correct name or pronoun out loud three times. So it's a way of like getting that. It's really habit is what it, <laughs> what it is. And, you know, yet using pronouns may feel weird at first, but it's really just changing a habit. And it's really, truly, yeah. If you make the effort, it means so much. And the first time you see a kid, I mean, I remember the first time I asked a kid at the center what their pronouns were and they weren't expecting it, like the look of relief on their face was just like monumental, like a whole part of them opened up knowing that they were safe in that space to be who they were. So it really does mean a lot. Can we have before we go on? Any questions about any of that? That answer questions you have about pronoun use? Nothing? Nobody online? Nothing online? It, it seems difficult. I have brought some books from our children's library. Explain <laughs> <laughs> it. And this, these are just some more um, tips, kind of uh, first to talk about some of the barriers that you may not think about. Um, when people, LGBTQ people, are seeking services or care, one that you know they're afraid of, we're afraid of a stigma. Um, and even if there's not a stigma, like even if you are open and affirming and welcoming of all people, if we don't put it out there, we don't know that. So we may be afraid of being discriminated against or, or having violence used against us because we don't know. Um, Depend potential mistreatment, you know, if people have received mistreatment from other folks offering services or care. Um, big concerns about being outed, and this is especially with kids. I, I would say it's so, so important. Like, I don't know what your requirements are as volunteers, but, um, you know, kids are terrified of being outed to parents often. Um, I know a lot of schools have policies in place for that, but sometimes people do mess that up, and even around. Like I know for us, we have some kids who use one pronoun with us, but they don't want us to use that pronoun with their parents. So really like the best case is just getting to know your kid and making them feel comfortable and open and, and protecting that, you know, <laughs> making sure you know who they want to know these things about them. Uh, yeah, so heteronormativity and cisnormativity, we talked about that a little bit, but um, around healthcare, it's really rampant, just making assumptions about who you are, what kind of healthcare you need based on the way you appear and not asking the full questions or um, feeling misunderstood, often, often. Fear that identity will be seen as a mental illness. So, and just remember too, that kids and people who are just coming out, um, they may have no, they may have no clue. And so it, one of the reasons what's good to educate yourself is because they're opening up to you as an adult and you don't want to make them educate you, right? So they, they may be, if they feel comfortable enough, they may come to you as someone who can help. And so knowing how to do that and how to get them resources is really important. Um, so really what we're talking about when we're talking about competently affirming care is an approach to services where you're actually embracing a positive view of LGBTQIA identities and relationships and, and acknowledge and address that negative influences, homophobia, transphobia, heterosexism, cissexism actually have on the lives of the people that you're serving. Like don't, don't act like that doesn't exist and there's no way to subtract that from the identity. Like I said, so in the services that you're offering, Knowing a, a, a youth's identity may be a big important thing for you to determine what services they need and how things are impacting them. 
affirming services include welcoming, understanding, and celebrating identities, understanding their diverse and nuanced identities, not making assumptions again, not assuming all issues are related to sexuality or gender. Because that's the other thing, if you're LGBTQ, you may be afraid of folks just thinking everything that you need is related to that identity, and it may not be. Um, Respect, just listening and respecting really is the biggest deal. Honor, honoring identities and not trying to push a label or give someone an identity that they don't claim. Um, and yeah, just again, recognizing the real impact of oppression on LGBTQI people. And so then again, these are things you can do is just continually educate yourselves on LGBTQIA experiences and culture. Even if you are a member of the community, like we said, we all have a lot to learn. Um, we are open at the Lexington Pride Center every week, Tuesday through Saturday, 12 to 6. Saturday is call first because we're at a lot of different places. But um, we have a full library there. We have resources. Any of our staff are happy to talk with you and answer questions past this. So you can always um, come there. Um, also, if you have kids, you need to, you know, we run a, a youth group for our kids between 13 and 17 on Tuesday nights. Um, we have lots of games, social groups, gaming groups, movies, lots of social events. We've been working on a parenting group, um, especially to help younger kids, because we feel like when they're younger, parents need to be involved and they're usually supportive or we wouldn't know, <laughs> we wouldn't know they're out. So, so putting those kinds of resources together, we, you know, and, and Burley, I think, has given you a list of potential resources for trans kids. Um, there's a group in Lexington called Transparent Lex, which is made up of parents of trans kids. They have a they meet in person, but they also have an online group on Facebook, and they're really they have like all of the resources. Like that's where we send any parents who come to us um, who need information and resources. Yeah, transparent like yeah, it's on the it's on the list with phone numbers. Um and if you give me all the handouts, I'll scan them in and uh, okay. online people you can get them in a follow-up awesome. email after yeah. the train. Yeah. yeah. Um Trans Kentucky is our it's like 16 and up for trans folks or people who are coming out. That means once a month on the first Saturday. Um and we they have a server too, so if folks are interested, we can always add them to the server. You know, usually we send people back to the community to connect with other people who have resources and answers. So um, so those are just some of the things. So definitely you can reflect on your own biases and attitudes and recognize your areas of privilege. And all that means is you may not see these things. If you're not part of the LGBTQ community, you may never have experienced discrimination on that basis. So trying to educate and keep your eyes open to the places you may not be aware of. Um, and just be open about your commitment to providing affirming services for all clients, regardless of sexuality or gender. Like name tags, stickers, buttons. I know a lot of doctors will wear like a flag, you know, trans flag or pride flags, just kind of without saying it, let their patients know that they're affirming. Support LGBTQIA communities, events, and businesses, and be active in the community. So that's all the time, not just when you have someone applying it, but if you can be part of the community and learn about the community, um, you see, you know, you'll appear more genuine and authentic, and hopefully will be. <laughs> And just make your support visible again. And um, so I think you guys don't do intake forms, is that right? You just meet sort of on an informal basis with your with your clients. So um, you know, intake forms are really important, but even when you're meeting people, just not meeting the youth, not making assumptions about you know their gender or sexuality, and making sure you're known as a safe person so that they can open up. And use correct terminology and just ask when you're not sure. But it's better that like if you come to ask us or that you do research online rather than you know asking like, I mean, you can ask people what pronouns they prefer and you know how they identify, but if you have technical questions, it's better to go somewhere else and educate yourself than with your clients. We and, yeah, we do. And so part of being a great provider is being a great ally. And that's really, you know, me supporting when you're not part of a marginalized identity, still trying to support and um, uh, do, do your best by that group. So there are some steps you can take. One is to listen. 
Um, you know, you got to recognize that when someone comes out to you about any aspect of their gender or sexuality, they're trusting you. You know, they're seeing you as a trusted individual. And that's actually, it's like a powerful position to be in, but you have to take care with what you do with that. Um, and then affirm. So you're, you're recognizing their humanity and their experience. And even if it isn't what you understand or believe, just affirming that it's legitimate, you know, to that person. Um, so for example, if you have a kid who says, I went to the movies, you know, boy who said I went to the movies with my boyfriend, instead of ignoring it or making it feel awkward, you just say awesome. If you enjoy it, you know, don't, you know, make it a big deal. <laughs> educate. So uh, you want to educate yourself and others. Um, but always know you don't know everything. We don't know everything. And, like, it's changing by the second. So just be willing to learn from what people tell you. Um, so instead of asking your LGBTQ friend or colleague, take the time to Google or come to the Pride Center or call the Pride Center or look for other sources for that information. And then speak up. And an ally is someone who speaks up whether or not an LGBTQ person is in the room. So someone's misgendering someone or using the wrong pronouns or you see policies that are discriminatory toward LGBTQ or not even discriminatory, but you know, not inclusive of the LGBTQ community that you're willing to stand up and say something. Because sometimes it's harder for the people who belong to that group to, to actually ask for that. <laughs> Can I say something like that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I got a call yesterday from somebody who was straight and they were at work and they heard somebody making like non binary jokes. And then they started to make ace jokes. And then somebody in the room was like, hey, I'm ace. And it came cold turkey stuff. But they were like, how do I handle that? It's not about me. Like, I'm not the person they were making fun of. And if you're ever in that situation, that's referred to as third party harassment. So if you hear it and it's about other people and it's still derogatory, defamatory, it is negative in some way, you're still hearing and experiencing harassment, even if it's not about your identity. So we're on to questions. Anybody have anything that wasn't answered or anything you're still curious about or <clears throat> understand or disagree with? Or, <laughs> you know? uh, a question online. Do you know any youth mental health facilities that are supportive of LGBTQ youth or mental health facilities that are not supportive and should not be recommended? Um, as far as I would need to probably know more about what type of facilities, like inpatient facilities or... Like I know, I know we have a list of therapists and like, you know, inpatient, inpatient. So, um, we could probably, we could, we probably have it in our resource list if someone wanted to call or email us okay. and we could provide that. I mean, off the top of my head, you know, I know we've done training at the Ridge and they're generally very LGBTQ inclusive, Like they still struggle with the gender separation thing. A lot of those those laws have not caught up with people's reality, but most places have a way for non-binary folks to be either housed in a separate situation or to let them use. Um, so I would feel fairly confident about referring people to the ridge. Um, Did it say for you? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, but we could definitely find out if we don't have it in our resource list. We know the people to know. I mean, uh, Transform Health, is um, the clinic at UK that was specifically designed for LGBTQIA people. And um, they have a ton of resources and they will know the inside information about that. Um, and you can always contact them too. Um, but yeah, we have we have different lists, but I don't have them all memorized, but we're happy to help people find those resources. <laughs> yeah. Is there a question. Yeah, um, I personally have worked, you know, as a CASA advocate for um, LGBTQ youth, yeah. and I have experience with working with younger um, youth. That some adults, um, social workers, and things that I've worked with have often said, "Oh, it's a phase. Yeah. It's a phase." And I, do you have any advice on how you should respond to that? I mean, the way I usually respond is, "So what?" <laughs> yeah, like it's really like, yeah, it could be. I mean, but you can't tell that. I mean. 
nobody brings up those same objections if someone is expressing, you know, if a boy is expressing interest in girls, you don't say that's a phase, right? You don't, you know, like nobody even has to say they're heterosexual. So it's clearly that people aren't comfortable with, you know, kids being homosexual or kids being queer or trans. Um, and so they want it to go away. Really, <laughs> It's usually what is meant by that. But in reality, you know, a small percentage of kids, it may be not that it's a phase, but their understanding of themselves changes as it does for all of us, you know. Um, so our, my biggest reaction is it, does, it doesn't matter. It's not harmful to believe what they say. There's nothing in that that's going to harm them, you know, and even for trans kids. And I know there's been a lot of talk about, you know, trans kids letting them transition too early, but I think people have a lot of fear that's not based in reality. Like nobody is doing surgeries on six-year-old kids, right? <laughs> Most of the time when you're talking about kids who want, who are trans at that age, it's a social transition and just respecting names and pronouns. And then if they decide when they're 10 or 12, that doesn't work for them. And like not, no harm is done, <laughs> you know? So yeah, so that's really my reaction is it could be, but it doesn't really, doesn't really hurt them. And, it's more harmful, I think, to misgender a kid who truly knows who they are or to put them in a box they don't belong in than it is to let them express who they are and change their mind later. So, yeah. I always say when I get those calls from folks that you can either go down in that kid's record book as somebody who could be talked to and could be trusted and would support them. Or you could be someone that they don't tell anything dangerous to ever again. Yeah. 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 I have a question. I hope it's not. No, please. <laughs> but are you born? Like, I have a friend that was gay. Mm -hmm. And I told her, I was like, I mean, I, I really wanted to know more about it because I had no idea. You know, I just wanted to, I didn't know anything. And um, she said that you are born that way. And I said, I've never looked at a girl and thought, God, I'd like to be with her. I said, I just so I don't understand. And she was like, because you're not gay. Yeah. So you were born. born. There's some short. There's some short. <laughs> yeah. So, but the truth of it is probably it's something hereditary, but not exactly always. It, it's different for everybody. I mean, and there are definitely some kids who know from the time you know, they're knee high to a grasshopper. And then there are others of us who don't figure it out until much later in life. Um, and it, I guess, again, I would say it doesn't really matter. I mean, even if it's a choice, if there's nothing wrong with it, why do we care? <laughs> right? <laughs> so if you can choose. I do not ask everything. So no, that's good. You know? And the other part of that is the reason I think you can't know is that because culture and society forces this thing on us. And depending yeah. on your personality, how much your own subconscious or conscious even can let you come out. Like, if, you know, I didn't come out until I was in my early 20s, right? And I dated boys until that time. But I had I had no safety net for that. Like, there was no question. I didn't have room for it. It would have been life-threatening now. But I know Burley went through similar stuff and was out from... I was uh, out at 14, and I was uh, kicked out of my house at 15 for it. So, yeah. like... Yeah. There's no one size fits all story. So you can't be say like you're straight and then I, I think I'm a big left man. I mean that doesn't happen. I mean it's just an awakening realization. Like I mean for me, I mean I'm just speaking from my own terms, and I think it could be different from everybody. I probably always was, but I didn't act on it or express it because I didn't know I could until I was in a safe enough space to explore that possibility. But, you know, for some kids, it's very apparent very early on and they never change their, it's just, it's different for everybody and it doesn't make one way more or less legitimate. And honestly, we don't, we don't know all of the answers and how much of that is genetics and how much of it is personality and culture. And, you know, yeah. Well, I have a granddaughter who went with this guy for like five years. Um, they got married. They got fancy wedding, and then four or five months afterwards, she comes home and says, "I'm moving home." And I'm like, "No, you're not." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. She said, "And then she said she was a uh, lesbian." And I was, I mean, you know, I just, I didn't know what to say. I mean, well, I support her. Yeah. You know, my family supports her, and. I don't have a problem with it because yeah. I learned a lot from a friend of mine. Yeah. 
I was just like, I never saw any of that. Yeah, you, know? you can't, you can't always though. And that's, again, people think it looks like one thing and it doesn't really, like there's no, there's no like, oh yeah, we knew because your thumb was this much longer than yeah. <laughs> there is no, you're not born with a tattoo or, you know, you just have to trust people's own that, that people know more about themselves than you, yeah. like you have to trust their own. Um, and, and you know, sometimes it happens, you never suspect it. And all of a sudden someone comes out or transitions or, um, you know, my, my nephew, I never would have expected at all that he, he would have transitioned to being a, a boy, you know, that he was really a boy. Um, but I believe him, you know, and I support yeah. that experience. And there's sometimes it's like you struggle to get your head around it, but there isn't really any sign, you know, one scientific way of proving the thing, as long as you're respecting and supporting people and their choices. I think that's, it's all people can ask. Yeah, I know you had, uh, I think it was something that was on there yeah. that mentioned about Black, yeah. black youth. Yeah. Uh, because we are brought up in a very, very Baptist, very mm -hmm. religion. And it was uh, more or less, either you go by the Bible or you go on straight to hell. Yeah. You know, regardless yeah. of what it was. So a lot of times we knew who was. Yeah. At a very, very young age. Yep. But because of the fear of being mistreated, uh, being shunned, mm -hmm. uh, parents trying to beat it out of them, yep. uh, throwing them out of their house. I mean, I think a lot of times from my experience, it's more of the parents or the adults concerned with what they look like. Yep. You know Absolutely. what I'm saying? Absolutely. It's one of those yeah. things that Oh my God, what would they say about it? You know what I'm yeah. Instead of my, saying, who cares what they think and just listen to your child. Just my partner's, my child. partner's mother's first question is like, well, what am I going to tell people? Like it was all. So it was very, uh, it was very hurtful. Yeah. Growing up in a black community. First of all, we black. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's already a discrimination. Yeah. And then you may be gay or Absolutely. whatever the case is. And it's almost like you have nowhere to go. Yeah. And that's, thank you for, you know. for saying that because that's hugely important. And uh -huh. one of those things like none of us are all one thing. And so right. for us who, who face, you know, who are black and LGBTQ is a whole different lens, you know, and you cannot right. separate out those parts of yourself. And that's so people who have pressure from within the community face an even larger obstacle because if you're going to be disowned not just by your family right. but your entire community or the family and church and community that you've grown up with that's huge <laughs> I mean <laughs> and when yeah. you say you have nowhere to go you're talking about young people that are on the streets that are being abused when they yeah. go on the street because yeah. now they got to survive yeah you know so then you're talking about one thing on top of another on top yeah. of another and that's where you was talking about the suicide rates yeah. are the yeah. fact that oh, you higher. become addicted to drugs or alcohol because you're trying to deal with not only being gay or trans or whatever it is but you got your own community and family and nobody to support yeah. you so so you're also trying being, to survive a lot of us being costly yeah. i think it puts us in a very strong position to where when the, we are communicating with them yep. and we're picking up on certain things that we're able to handle them with kid gloves so they don't feel that it's one more person yeah. that is, Absolutely. you know, shutting them down. Or Yeah, when I was reading about what you all do, that was my impression, too. Like, yeah. you could really have a key role in exactly. the work with kids one-on-one -on -one and over time. I mean, you could be the one person if they don't have anybody mm -hmm. else you know, in their family or in their support network who can be supportive, you could be that person. I yeah, and I think and that trickles with the ones that we do work with and the ones that we, with this kind of learning, then they may be an asset to the next one. So it's almost like a village. Yeah. We're going to continue to yeah. do that, but we have to have the right tools yeah, absolutely. in order to, you know, yeah. make sure that they are, getting the care and yeah. the need that they absolutely you know that absolutely they need, so. and, and Burley has passed around like lots of resources mm -hmm. and again if you don't if you have something later on a question that comes up or you need resources you can feel free to call us that is exactly what we do 
Um, I will mention Just Fun Kentucky um, gave us a grant to be able to do this kind of training for other nonprofits and uh, community service organizations. So we're grateful to them. But, you know, that's what that's our whole gig. <laughs> you know, we're there to answer phones and answer questions from people in the community or from service providers and parents. And, um, yeah, that's what we do. So we can do that. Uh, uh, so on what you're just saying, um, how, you know, work with the teen group. Uh, we have three of the 12 kids that are in there in foster care. One of which uh, is from Denver, and they were sent to Kentucky where they now live in a foster home. And so for these kids, you know, a lot of these kids' first experience with grief is not their grandma or grandma or grandpa, whoever passing. It is recognizing that they are dead to the people that they right. would love them to. Mm -hmm. So that is, that's hard. That's hard. It is. Kids. Yeah. And, I, and so any any of y'all working with foster kids, like so that that's some of their first experience with grief is themselves. Right. questions um just as someone <clears throat> asked that we share um that uh this thursday is glad to wear purple to support lgbtq youth and, yeah. this well, and then we do have one more question how should you address someone you can't tell if they are transitioning to a male or a female a person sitting behind me in church had facial hair but was wearing a dress i did not want to make them uncomfortable I would say most people who are clearly not passing, um, I I would just, you know, introduce myself and share my pronouns and say, what pronouns should I use? Or what are your pronouns? You know, I think most people would much rather have that question asked. Um, people may feel differently, though, but that's my approach. And it generally, it generally works out, you know, like if someone is wearing a dress and has facial hair, they probably hear you know, have had the question or had and would much rather have someone ask than be stared at or avoided or, you know. Yeah, but some women have facial hair. Some women do, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. Are you all in need of any volunteers or anything like that? <laughs> we always need volunteers, <laughs> yeah, we, for lots of different things. <laughs> if anybody is a driver and has one hour that they can donate on Wednesday, our biggest need, our ongoing need, we run a food bank. We're one of the few food banks that does delivery service for people that cannot leave their home or that are terminally ill. And coming to the center, picking up the meals, dropping them off, all less than one hour, Wednesdays, anytime between 2.30, and 5 30 p.m so give us a call if you're interested in that that is our number one need uh, if you're not a driver or you're not comfortable doing a delivery route um, then there are a lot of in-house things particularly right now we just renovated so there's all kind of busy work to do there's like data entry and then if you're free during the day on a regular schedule we need help you know, literally just saying hello to people on the phone and coming in the door as other people are working with people that have come in the door and made phone calls. Let me, I'll, thank you for asking that. And I'm just going to go over kind of what, everything we do. I realize I hadn't talked about that and some people had asked about it. So we do operate the Prize Center as a safe space for people to drop in, ask questions. We have multiple resource lists and resources at the center. So people are just coming out or you know, need legal service that is LGBTQ affirming or medical care. We can help with all of that. We also have a 2000 title library that's all LGBTQ subject matter or um, written by LGBTQ folks. And it's everything from little kids up to young adult to adult fiction to all kinds of nonfiction. We have a free computer lab, Wi-Fi, you know, headphones. So if people want to come in, work on applications, need help finding jobs, those kinds of things. Um, and then some of our bigger programs are People's Market, which is our food pantry that prioritizes LGBTQ or people with um, disabilities or who are homebound um, because we do offer the delivery. Um, and I think we, I don't know, process like a thousand pounds of food a week, you know, for folks. So that's a really big, a big need. And that we found out during COVID was a huge need. And that program has grown like wildfire. Um, 
And then in the evenings, after hours, we run everything from like uh, role playing games a couple nights a week. So yeah, it's in this brochure as a list of everything. We have board game nights once a month. We have a dinner for people over 50 once a month, which is this intergenerational. Friday. This Friday. Mm-hmm. This Friday. You want a free meal and you want seven. to hang out with yeah. the young gay people and old gay people. people. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a big family meal and people hang out and socialize. Um, we have the Trans Kentucky group that's specifically for trans and gender non-conforming people. We have a new group for partners of yeah. trans folks. And ha- having sat in on that one, that's a really unique group because these are people who have been married. Well, not all of them, but in the, in the people seeking support the most, I feel like, are people that are in marriages where one of the partners has come out as trans or gender non-conforming. And they don't want to take away from that experience for their partner by the way being like, but I'm going through this too, but they are. So, you know, that's a space for them to come together and ask the questions like, how are you doing with these things? Or what do you do about this? So, you want to hit that one more time and we'll show our contact information. I gave her a card to keep it. Oh, you did too. So you may not need it, but that's that's where we are in our website. And my email address in Burley's is B-U-R-L-E-Y, same, same one part. We always use our first name, so... That's how you can get us. Feel free. We hope you come see us. (laughs) Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thanks for having us. It's very good to be here.